Well, um, I'm ha very happy to be here. I'm the last one of the speakers of the event. Uh, thank you, Xenia. Thank you, Christian, for the introduction. Um, I'm here to present a project that I developed last two years um, that has to do with um, a new approach of type classification. Let me see. This research started when COVID was spreading throughout the world and we were forced to stay at our homes in a lockdown that lasted for two years. In the beginning of May 20, uh, 2021, Atai Pai made public that it was time to drop the box classification that we have been using for more than 16 years. This presentation is about a digital tool in order to understand and learn how to define, analyze, and classify old, new, and future typefaces. It is useful uh, for students and teachers in graphic design, for type professionals, for type amateurs, and for the next generation of users. So, um, where is our starting point? It has been very interesting to me to see that even though that we are today speaking um, in the realm of digital typo typography or the digital space or the virtual reality or inter inter artificial intelligence, that the DNA of the movable type is still among us. The invention of Gutenberg um, of the movable type is still um, working in the digital era. The thing is that now typography is not only meant to be read, it is meant also to be more expressive. And sometimes, as we saw in the in the presentation today of um, of uh, sorry, I have here I wrote here his name of Ching Yun Choi. Type as an experience. The first, the second uh, conference of today. Typography is not only made to be read; it's only it's also made to have an experience. And this is because technology has evolved with it. The era of movable type is, um, I, I, I'm, not going, I'm not going to say this categorically, but it's maybe coming to an end. Um, the, but its principles, as I was saying, uh, are still among us. We're still talking about spacing. We're still talking about leading. We're still talking about um, justification. We're still talking about um, for, uh, um, counter and counter punch. Uh, these are some typographic concepts that typography is still, uh, it's in the habitus of the typographic field. And that's the way typography has been built through centuries. So um, the difference is that technology has changed. So um, this presentation, as I was saying, um, was made to obtain a master in critical theory. And it is accompanied, accompanied by, um, by a document, a written document of about 140 pages, where I explain with much more detail uh, things that I'm going to try to uh, make a, a resume or a synthesis of, 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 of these ideas. It has more to do with understanding typography as a way of thinking. It has to do with understanding the links between typography, history, and technology, and understanding the way that all these things together has to do with users. Uh, because users has, have all, also changed. We do not relate to typography in the same way uh, that's in the um, as in the time of Gutenberg or in the 50s or 60s when uh, Vox created his uh, typography classification. The world has changed. Nevertheless, there have been some inventions that have um, helped shape the typography world last century. These are some of them. The most important of them was the linotype um, of Otmar Mergenthaler. That represents the industrial type, uh, the industrial side of typography. Um, this object, this invention, was uh, among us for almost one century, or maybe one century. And there were some other inventions that really uh, were 
kind of um, other kind of machines, but with the same principles uh, that made more or less efficient the um, the way that industrial topography functioned. One of them was the monotype, and the other one, very important, was a pantograph. Why do I mention this? Because thanks to these uh, inventions, topography uh, suffered changes. Many of the designs, the classical designs that were made in the, in the last century, in the 19th century, were adapted and sometimes um, suffered a drastical um, adjustments in their design to fit the technology. So this is a room um, of how uh, Los Angeles Times, this is the composing room of Los, Ange Los Angeles Times. And as you can see, typography was an industrial thing, uh, not, nothing to do with the typographers working on their own, making home office or talking about uh, font engineering or font production. It was more uh, close to the industrial revolution kind of work. There is a, well, um, I was thinking about the work about uh, of Ali Sawa, uh, who made an excellent research about women typing this in this in this era. Another technology, a very important technology that really made a shift in the shape of typography, in the shape of letters, was the photocomposition in the um, in the fifties. We know now, um, well, this is a technology that didn't last for too many years, only 20, more or less. But the important thing is that it made more accessible for everyone, well, for, for, for the industry or for the people that work in the printing business or the design of typographies, um, that really made more accessible to design typefaces. Um, because all the metal, all the industrial thing uh, that had to do with typography uh, changed, so um, we can we can remember the catalogs of Letraset or Mecanorma um, that were a real um, a very joyful, uh, or we can find very different, very sharp, very funny, very today um, forms of letters um, that some of them became classics, for instance. That, that lasted for maybe up to the 90s when uh, digital type started to uh, recover them and put them in the digital format. So then later, the digital typography in 1973, this is um, the, the birth date of digital typography according to the book of uh, Dr. Peter Carroll. Um, this typography, and sorry, an artificial intelligence that was given in the Atypi conference in Amsterdam, 2013, gives also um, or, or tells the story of how um, the digital technology um, long, um, long before the computer, at least a decade, um, developed important technologies uh, around it, like na naming, for instance, rasterize or vectorization or um, the, this idea of the dots or the nodos, or the, 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 yeah, that form that typography were created in order to explain or to um, define what was the digital typography. Then we have the, in the 80s, we have the bitmap font, fonts. This is something that we, many of us maybe we are aware of because of the, the first Macintosh. Um, it's undeniable the, um, the value of the work that Microsoft, uh, sorry, uh, Steve Jobs and, and Apple made, and Microsoft, yes, in, 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 the, in a moment, and in a certain moment, made uh, in order to to make better the display of typefaces in a computer. And the idea of uh, having a desktop um, as a metaphor, as a, um, a metaphor of the work space 
yeah, I find it brilliant because it helped precisely to make more friendly the space of the computer that um, um, before this time was completely uh, was completely uh, uh, boring because uh, these were green letters with a dark these were green letters with a dark with a dark um, background so the 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 Macintosh project really changed the way that we see uh, typographies in our in our life and of course this was a start for all the software um, that came that ha had to be invented with it to to make it work because we must remember that there were no software for Macintosh at the time so this is a sort of a resume of a, not a resume a synthesis of the of what I've been saying, the type technologies that have ruled uh, last century were, well, the movable metal type that I just um, going to mention as Gutenberg in 1450 and the European classic typography. Um, in the By the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, we had the Industrial Revolution that were very important in the UK and the United States. The These three inventions that are considered as the critical points in the history of, of development of typography, the pantograph, the hot and metal type, and the creation of the American type founders, because all the international industry developed um, around these inventions and this uh, the creation of these associations. Then in the 50s, the photocomposition, later the digital typography, and with this, the start of a uh, all the problems and all the solutions and all the terminology that we know, um, like bitmap, a postscript type one and three, multiple master, open type, and web fonts. In the twenty, in the first two decades of the twenty-first century, we have the variable fonts. Um, Lawrence mentioned the other day the exact date I updated my presentation. It was uh, the nine of the, the yes, and um, in 2016, nine. The, sorry, the day of the birth of the variable fonts. I made this timeline to understand how the metal industry, the metal type, ruled for almost five centuries, and I am not afraid to say that maybe variable fonts is going to be the technology that is going to be with us for, for this century at least, but maybe the next also, because after all that I have seen in the Inscript uh, event and here in this, uh, in all the, in many of the conferences, um, the possibilities of uh, variable fonts are immense and are very huge and we are in a stage of ex exploring the possible of the possibilities of these technologies. Um, some of them, uh, well, for instance, um, the, um, the um, talk that we had today with Michael Parson exploring the limits of the variable fonts, I found it amazing. The one of uh, type of experience also, a uh, very interesting talk, Beyond the Stroke. We're going to talk about a little bit about that because this theory of writing that was written by uh, um, a Nordzeich is still also uh, present or is still in, in the theory uh, and understanding how typography is made. But there is one point that I'm going to develop then. So now uh, we know that uh, the only technology available for digital typeface are open type web fonts or the variable fonts, because we know that Adobe is going to um, leave the support for all the other technologies. We can understand why, because open type open type represents the best option of these uh, technologies. So um, this is not a problem. So just to say that uh, where it, I see that the the um, Variable fonts technology is having so much uh, to be explored still that we don't really know what might be the next step. We can talk about uh, uh, gener generative typography or 
uh, typography with artificial intelligence, we will see in the next decades. So let's talk about the classification dilemma. Um, in order to arrive to these uh, points, I studied a lot and I read a lot about uh, typeface classifications. Um, my mentor or my tutor was Jose Scaglione, so we had a very, very interesting talks about uh, this subject. And we, uh, well, we all understand now why the box system is outdated. Uh, that's one of the first reasons that the type 5 for sure dropped um, the system in, in uh, the last years. Um, another problem that I found that is um, that repeats itself in all the in all the theories around typography classification, the classification of typography is the folksonomy. What is this? That users apply public tax to online items, typically to make those items easier for themselves or others to find later. This is uh, what do we mean when we say a solemn typography? This has to do with our cultural background. This has to do with what we understand as solemn, and it has to do with our experience, uh, our age, maybe. Um, it's not the same for a student um, in the university to, to define solemn or fun or um, this kind of uh, definitions that really doesn't say anything. It's completely subjective to, to the interpretation of the user. And this is the way type classification is more or less built today, because it's the easier way for people to get to find what they are looking for. But uh, how can we name uh, new designs that come from new technologies? For instance, the magnific, uh, the man, um, great project that we saw, um, the, the twin line of Jamie Chang is amazing. How can we define this kind of typographies um, according to the, what we know about uh, the, the way we can define this kind of, of, of forms? Well, um, this was something that I was thinking all the time because I am a teacher and one of the, the most um, um, obvious problems when I talk about uh, typographies or type classification has to do with show to my students where, how to define or where to find or how can they name professionally because I think that's important to use the words that exist to name terms. Um, so they can find the typographies that they are looking for. There is a need to classify with non-Latin scripts. I think that with the invention of, um, well, the software now, from, um, uh, yeah, FontLab or Glyphs or whatever, now we, the design of, of typographies for other scripts is, is relatively easier than before. There are communities that design on different languages, and this in this presentation we have uh, some um, some to uh, not in this I mean in this event we had some talks that uh, showed uh, other scripts uh, either than um, more than Latin, and of course we have to take in consideration the users. There are many users now, a lot of users. Uh, we have the students, we have the professionals, we have the the amateurs, we have the, the more or less skilled and well, we have to, there is no more an, um, an, an industrial um, industry, uh, if I may say so, um, that is uh, selling typefaces, metal typefaces uh, for, the, for the printers throughout the world. Now everybody can buy a typeface or create a typeface in their homes. So the way the market of the typography has completely changed. And something very important for me also is that it should be updatable in time. This is in the future. I think, yes. So this is the next one. So I, after a lot of research, I chose four study cases. The first one is Maximilian Box for obvious reasons. Catherine Dixon, I'm going to explain it uh, why, and Maximilian Box and Will Hill. Uh, there is an excellent uh, presentation that Will, Will Hill gave, I think, in 
2018 about um, type classification and a document that was published by the Parson Journal of Information Mapping. So, uh, Maximilian Box. Okay, Maximilian Box. What can I say about Maximilian Box? This is a small, a small, um, um, I'm going to say something about him. Um, well, he was a designer. We have to understand that the time when we, when they adopted or created, when he created this type classification model, it was the time of the photocomposition and what was the photocomposition. And, and at the same time, a type I was founded. It was created in 1953. So this is the, um, the era of photocomposition and they need the, the, the one of the ideas that uh, Jerome Peño uh, had in mind when he founded the Atypi was to protect the type designs because with the photocomposition it was very easy to stole, to steal them to steal the design or make other designs with slightly differences. So he wanted to have a sort of a, a patent to protect the uh, designs of typefaces. Um, in 1959, the box classification was proposed and it was adopted until 1962. The box classification model was thought for the industry. That's something that we have to think about it. Maximilian Box, this guy, was a French designer, journalist and illustrator. And he worked for Devernian uh, Peignot, where he did graphic design and specimens. Um, he created this classification of nine styles that represent a very French way of understanding typography. As important things, um, um, the naming, Le Garal, eh, Le Didon, for instance, are um, names that he invented of, of the fusion of Garamond and Aldus or Didon and Bodoni. So this is something that has lasted up to now because there is a success in this description. They have to deal with a form, with a shape, and with a time. Well, this was the first one. Um, yes, this is the classification that Will Hill uh, made, having in consideration box uh, at Taipei in 2010, and he added some of the um, of other, other cases, let's say, the scripts or non-Latin, black letter, and manual. But mostly, is mostly the same thing as box, but updated. I'm going to talk about this later. Catherine Dixon. Um, this is a project that I find very interesting. It was founded by the Higher Education Funding Council for England, uh, but unfortunately, it couldn't be finished. In, two, in, two, in 2018, there, the book, Typeform Dialogues was published. It's, it's online and it's free. Um, with uh, where Catherine Dixon and Eric uh, Kindel write uh, uh, with all detail the why this project didn't uh, finished, why they couldn't finish it, all the problems that they had. Well, they couldn't finish it because they hadn't more. They couldn't have more money. But also, it was a very complex problem. Uh, it was the era of the CD, so it was supposed to be um, um, an interactive CD, and it was. Uh, they never really. Uh, they made a prototype that was never finished. But the most important thing about the, the Catherine Dixon classification system is that she creates three, the three times or three. Uh, he he. She arranges the forms of typefaces in three in three groups that work together to define a typeface. One is the source, that's uh, generics, uh, generic structural influences informing a type form, for instance, to say Roman or handwritten and so on. The other one is formal, basic individual units of description that refer to a typeface, design and construction. For instance, uh, shape, proportions, modeling, weight, and patterns. Patterns is a recurrent configuration of some of forms and formal attributes and patterns can be identified chronologically as evolution of a shape. Uh, we can have, we can see the evolution of patterns, for instance, in um, um, UCL typefaces or in Gothic typefaces. Those are of the most uh, important, uh, the, the three parts that work here with Catherine Dixon. 
This is the last one, the person journal for information mapping. This was very interesting as a research document because uh, this document analyzes 25 type classification systems uh, that were published in the last century from Theodore Lowe Divine, uh, Obdike, Maximilian Box, and, and at the end, it, 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 um, they chose also, this was a group of three researchers, they chose also uh, the classification system of important uh, graphic designers, like Ellen Lupton, of course, Catherine Dixon, and or Robert Brinkhurst. Uh, it has uh, three colors. Each color represents um, something, a style. It could be serif, sans, and topical. And topical is used instead of uh, display. It has something, it has a lot to do with taxonomy, this, this uh, pie chart. Well, uh, by examining, this is the, they made this analysis of these 25 uh, pie charts. And they, at the end, study how many of these uh, words to describe typefaces uh, are repeated. Some of them disappear, and some of them have to be up updated. And this is the final, the final proposal. This is, these are terms that are present in all these kind of uh, 25 uh, pie charts. And this diagram is a suggested master classification with, uh, that presents the recurring taxonomies through the 25 diagram diagrams analyzed. So, Robert Bricker says that typography is the craft of endowing human language with a dual visual form, but its hard wood is calligraphy. This is very important because we cannot forget that the Roman letter or the Gothic type that Gutenberg crafted comes from writing. And I think that the key in type classification is writing because when we start making typographies that come from other places are more uh, um, constructed or artificial typefaces. I am going to try to explain this idea. Um, we all know that the, these typefaces, the, the, the minuscule, the, the Carolingian minuscule, um, has this uh, description to be uh, written today, the ductus. In other scripts, like uh, Japanese and, of course, Chinese, we have the same thing. And this idea that later uh, Jerry Nordzeich uh, described in, in his theory of writing, translation, expansion, and rotation, is present in, this, in the writing of, uh, of any, uh, of any uh, uh, script. So how, what have we done, or how can we analyze um, the origin of this Roman form, then uh, to the to the Jensen's Roman that come. Uh, well, this is maybe a, a direct connection, but um, this is the result. Let's say so to the digital version of the Jensen's Roman by Robert Slimbach in 1996. This is the the canon of the Roman alphabet is the one that we have been using for the last five centuries. What is happening today? The canon is changing. We have seen a lot. Uh, we have seen a lot in this uh, event. Uh, we have uh, this cube of, uh, by Jerry Nordsai. Um, uh, Ronnie Gun uh, yes, sorry. Ronnie Ginosaur also talked about this with her Hebrew project that I found very interesting. And we have all the terms that we need to define typefaces in when if we go to the to the basic stuff. The type cooker, that is a tool that was made to help students to learn typefaces with a technique, is also a very uh, useful tool to understand the way typeface is constructed. So this is what we're living now. How come that we come from here? This is the Roman, the Roman canon, uh, of course, in the letter Helvetica, to this. Here, we cannot see writing. We see construction. We see vector points. We see um, experimentation. We see many other things. And this has to do with technology because designers not always, they are not designing they are not drawing letters uh, uh, when they design. They are constructing letters. And this is 
the digital culture era. This has to do with a tool that we are using, that is the vector, the vector, the yeah, the designing computer. This is another example. Okay, another example. Okay, ah, here it is. We can see also in new designs that are not precisely made for reading. Typography is becoming more expressive today because technology allows it. We are not, uh, we do not want to make a typeface that lasts centuries. We are trying to explore the possibilities or the boundaries of typography. Today, with the talk of, of Michael Parson, that's what he said. Maybe we should see from now on to all the possibilities of typography might become. Maybe the canon of the typography as we know it is changing. Or this, this is completely illegible. It's interesting as shapes, but this is completely illegible. This means that this typography is more an experiment as in the era of, of uh, photocomposition than something to be read. Or this, for instance. There is a, a strong influence of Gothic influence, but it could be something else. This could be uh, alien scripts, I don't know. So, what is my approach to new classification? Okay, I named it the wiki type classification because I think that this kind of thing has to be made uh, by a community. This is not the task of one person or one institution. It has to be as a community. Uh, takes in consideration for access, purpose, technology, type description, and history. This diagram shows the fields where typography takes place. So if you, if you make a circle, as I am showing, of what happens inside these four axes, we have a typographic semantic field. We can define everything that we can see. Every, every typeface can be defined with these four parts. Of course, we have to develop the content of, of each one is accessible. So this is a diagram as I was, um, I, I, am, I have to say that I presented this, uh, um, my, my grade, I, I had it one month ago. And one of the most important things that I realized after the research is that taxonomy is very important. So I wasn't um, able, I didn't want to translate the terms because I, don't, I didn't want to make a mistake. Um, that this is something that, that, that um, happens now. There are many terms in English that mean the same thing. There should be a type um, taxonomic consensus about naming of the typefaces. So this is in Spanish, this part, but I think that I'm sure that you will understand. We have, even if it's type uh, digital typefaces or metal typefaces, we have the same uh, purpose always, typing text optical, experimental or ornamental. At the left, you can see an example. Technology, okay, here, uh, even if we um, take the technology that is no longer useful, the diagram is useful. So uh, metal, digital, photocomposition, wood, because the uh, type has its own category. There are typefaces that are, are identified immediately as wood. Here we have linotype, monotype, industrial foundation, or um, manual melting, this is what it means. And here we have variable fonts and open type and web fonts and an example. This is one of the most important diagrams um, that, that is a double diagram. This is the type description diagram, the most important because here you can see kind of a classification and its definition in the second level. But the most important thing that it has to do a lot with type cooker and with the theory of writing of uh, Norsyth is the structure complement diagram. This work together. And this is an example how we can define only with the shape of the letter, uh, we can define a type. So the last one is a history diagram. Uh -huh. Because there are there are um, 
there might be new forms, but they have to do with technology because it's the present time. So let's think about something. Let's think that we put these four uh, diagrams in one axis, past, the future, and that we can see them in the in our present to the future. How could this look? It would look like this. So this is a complete system, and the way it would work is this is a typeface, uh, sorry, a site, a website that is called Wikitype, where you can find some descriptions, some uh, definitions, and of course a way it uh, a way to show you how it might work, the way uh, an instruction, yes, a manual, let's say so, with definitions, with uh, taxonomy, with categories, and a gallery. So you have here a description with a welcome, etc. All of the axes um, might be filled with um, with this chart, where you can find all the possibilities for each axis. And if you press Enter, this might be the shape that you would be obtaining. The shape uh, shows the the parts that are present in a typeface. This is the, if it's a serif or some serif, this is a historical typeface. In the history, the, it, it, it makes part of the, of the um, humanistas. Difficult to translate this in English right now. And technology. It has been made in all these three technologies, metal, photocomposition, digital. And what's the use of the purpose of this typeface? It has always been used for titles or text, never displayed. Well, there might be uh, Garamond display typefaces, but its origin, because of, of its, its historical lineage, is uh, text. And here, with the structural complement, we can find what kind of acts, uh, X, uh, sorry, uh -huh. we can have. Uh, what are the, if it's slanted, how is it constructed? How is the width of the typeface? How is the stroke, the width, uh, the weight, sorry, or the contrast? So this gives us a lot of details about this regular typeface. Also, there might be a biography of the of the type of the of the typeface and the designer that you could print or save or share through social media to friends or clients or students, whatever. This is another example. This is the Sans from Lucas de Groot. So, as you can see, the shape of the typeface, the shape of the pie chart, or the shape of the system changes according to the typeface. Um, at the end, this is useful because I'm going to step to the next one. This is one of the typefaces I showed you. Uh, what's the purpose of this typeface? It's for title or ornamental. What the structure, this is a lineal, it's a sans serif. Uh, it is irregular and hybrid. What technology? Definitely it's web fonts or open type. And this is it, its um, component. It's a neo grotesque. And here we have all the definitions of the, like the type cooker, the width, the, the slant, the, uh, the uh, backs. Sorry, I, I, I. I'm finding my words. The width, the weight, uh, the stroke, etc. Well, yesterday, after the talk of uh, twin line typeface, <laughs> I updated this presentation because I wanted to see what kind of uh, form it might drop. And it works. I mean, um, it can be uh, classified. The usage of this typeface is titling or ornamental. I I do not see no one using this as a text face, type face. Um, this is a sans serif. It's regular. It's hybrid. It's digital. Definitely, it's a it's a, um, a variable font. It's a sans serif no grotesque. And here we have still the definition of the components, the individual components of this letter. At the end, what is going to happen? We can find a gallery. 
This is a visual gallery. This is a visual gallery of diagrams where we can see the weight of each one of these axes. We can see the lineage of the history or the technology or the, um, the way it is constructed or the usage. So someone who is searching for a typeface, uh, I don't know, for a poster of an art exhibit or whatever, instead of searching uh, art exhibit po uh, typography, might find something more interesting if he searches or she searches something like uh, display typeface or ornamental typeface, um, um, sans serif, hybrid. This is the space where you can do that, and you can find this catalog of possible typefaces that my uh, my uh, how can I say this the needs of 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 the person that is looking. So the interesting thing here is that the ones that has to put the information of the typeface are the users or a very experienced uh, graphic designer or typographer. Uh, usually, type designers don't care about what classification their, their typefaces are going to fit. It's mostly for the users that this tool is thought for students, for teachers, for professionals, or for amateurs. Someone, someone said that he tested today his typeface in Word and that it worked. I mean, this kind of people is the one that I'm th thinking. The, so closing, because I, I think I have, don't have too much time. This is a project, an online diagram, a type classification generator accessible to anybody. It creates a data bank about typographies, designers, foundries, and historic information that can be shared or printed. These unique diagrams allows us to understand the historical lineage, the technologic weight, and the recommended usage according to its very detailed anatomy. It classifies fonts that are used in the Latin script, but because typography, because typography comes from writing, it can work for other scripts. That's something very important that I wanted to say. It is needed a type te terminology consensus for each language. It's important to have a more efficient diagram, I mean, the more precise the description is, the more precise the diagram. Um, this model can be used with other writing scripts. That's what I said, because typography is the mechanical form of writing. The use of a diagram visually, uh, this is a topic that has been floating all the conferences uh, in, in all these days, helps understand type classification visually because it explains itself. Oof, and that's it. You, if you are interested in this project, uh, please drop me a line. Um, I am still looking for uh, programmers or developers to make the prototype. Uh, maybe you would like me to classify your typeface, or maybe uh, you are just interested in participating in some way. So, uh, well, this is it. <laughs> Hope you liked it. I'm open for all your questions or comments or complaints or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Leonardo. <laughs> yeah, I think that was um, really thoughtful. Well done. And I love all the questions and conversations uh, that can open up which reminds me that other people should drop their questions in the chat box, the chat and the question. Um, otherwise I will monopolize the conversation and <laughs> you, 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 you heard, <laughs> so. Hola. Hello, John Berry saying hello. <laughs> yes. Hola. Uh, John Barry also says uh, that he'd like to see examples of typefaces from Chinese, Thai, Bengali, and other non-Western scripts. It seems like it might work well, um, but yeah, I guess maybe if you can talk about, you do have some uh, CJK behind you, um, and <laughs> Lori, like how, how does this system fit? What have you seen? Sorry, I am reading the... <sighs> Well, um, sorry, 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 Senya, sen uh, please. That was the same thing, yes. It's a John Barry comment, yeah, about other scripts. 
the thing is that um, I need to to see, or I would like to understand, for instance, uh, how uh, other languages are written. Uh, I could make it maybe with uh, Japanese or Chinese because I understand more or less the way it works because I've seen typefaces in this uh, in these scripts, um, and I think it could be done. I mean. I don't know if there is um, taxonomy in order to define the parts of uh, Maliki Prakari more or less uh, talked about this in her in her in her talk to define the parts of the of the of the kanjis or the or the or you see what I mean the ductus or the kanjis or the parts of the structure of the of those of those letters. So um, I think that maybe uh, that's a good example, that's a good um, experiment to try to translate. But I think I need to work with someone, a speaker, and someone that knows how to write in these languages to understand the logic of writing in those languages. That's it. Uh -huh. okay. It's like very likely that we have people in this room that are capable of that. So. Um, call to action, reach out, get in touch. Um, right me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I have a comment on that. That uh, I think it's interesting the approach that is say like, that is putting like, even you mentioned earlier about the tags, the users nowadays, they do everything based on tags. Exactly. So even within our community, let's say if you get the example of uh, Behance, for instance, that people can set up galleries of other projects they like. They just create their own collections and then start gathering the way they, uh, they think it suits best uh, for them. And then I'm wondering if that could be a good way for even now that we have the AI prompts, that we have all this kind of experiments with Mid Journey and so that is basically actually, yeah, people, they make a sentence instead of making, just adding a tag. So I'm wondering how the system, if it could actually connect somehow with that. So let's say in a way that people say, I want a typeface that looks like a uh, 50s uh, from, and that reminds me of a song that I heard in the radio and something yes. that, that give a few more things and it can actually somehow connect uh, to this diagram. So I think it could be interesting. To... Yes, I think it, it, um, it depends also on the, for instance, in the historical in the historical axis, you could define, uh, you could be very precise because we can add, for instance, the the button or the cluster where it says decades. Mm -hmm. So, it's possible you could put the, uh, uh, typefaces from the fifties or from the eighties or from the nineties. You can find Susanna Likos, for instance, or I don't know John Benjamin. You know some iconic typefaces that really that we know already i think that we just have to add uh, a button or something to to push it and then it's part of the um, searching engine the search engine of the, of the system but for this i think uh, there has to be a test drive i mean there should be a prototype there should be you know because the thing of, of, of this system is that uh, it creates a, lot of, a data bank. So mm -hmm. the more input I receive or we receive, the bigger is the sample that we can that we can show. Uh -huh. Perfect. No, I, I like that direction that you just proposed because that is like the way that I talk with the designers that I collaborate. It's like a lot more in analogies and metaphors and things like that or other like brand associations. Something that Will Hill said in his speech is that we should stop thinking about type classification as a linear thing. It has mm -hmm. to be seen as something more... Um, he uses the word constellations, but his idea is that all the semantic fields that are in typography are, are together or work together. We have this habit of seeing typography as one thing, as technology or as historical, with an historical approach. Or, But the truth is that typography is a, 
an artifact that represents the culture that we're living in. So uh, variable fonts are for me, and because I am not a really a technological person, I, I like to observe and to see how people react and behaves and thinks with the technology that we have. So variable fonts for me, I think, is the most important invention after the Industrial Revolution or the creation of the black letter font of the, or the, you see what I mean? It's something that is really going to change the way we, well, uh, we communicate, of course, but the way we experience typography with our whole body, you see what I mean? Typography is becoming an experience because it's not only to read, it's also, a, it has to do with art, it has to do with, uh, uh, with experimentation, it has to do with code, and there are many authors that describe code as another way of writing. So it's like learning another language. So there is a, um, a new bubble of, 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 cement, of knowledge that, that it's opening here, that we are still, well, you are still exploring and taking a look inside. For me, it's very interesting to see all that uh, people are doing with technology because they are doing it. They are not thinking of what, they are not thinking of what they are going to do with that. You see what I mean? After is someone is going to take this idea and to make it useful for, etc. I think that that's the way it works. Yeah, I'll make a suggestion. I was looking at the axis that you have, that, that you proposed. Um, yes. I was thinking the, the emotional one. Let's say ah. when people, because when they choose a typeface, sometimes because they evoke some sort of feeling, emotions, or, and even some terms, because then I think that's the when it gets like a blurry line, because if you talk, let's say, uh, a futuristic font, for instance, what is futuristic for each person changes, even the concept of it. Yes. And most people, when they're choosing for a project, they sometimes they're driven by things like that. Let's say they have, uh, when you say about purpose, but I think the access that it puts as a purpose, it is for the use, right? So what, what, what's the aim for that? But usually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's more about which medium, medium you're tackling. So let's say if it's print, it's for web or something. But also if, when you think purpose as a way of or what you want to evoke, which kind of feelings, which kind of emotions you want to evoke with that graphic material. So I, I think, think that could be a way. Uh -huh. I, yes, I understand what you see. I try, I mean, it's a good idea, but I think that that's precisely what I am trying to avoid because this is, um, a little bit subjective. You see what I mean? What I, yeah, try, yeah. what I try to do is to make the more professional possible, to make the more uh, the more clear, the more direct, the more etc. Maybe, maybe there could be a, another version uh, with this kind of access for younger people. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> or, you see what I mean. But this is yeah, you're you're creating a dictionary. You're creating definitions, and like like it's a, a yeah. system that's built to be evolving would be would be the system, right? Like exactly. Thomas Finney says something. May I read it? <laughs> Humans like categories, but a lot of things we want to describe are on continuum. One thing I like about the system is that there are a bunch of we want to describe that are at least partially potentially independent of each other i like how this is system has some of that yeah that's it it mm -hmm. tries to mix all the things that we see in typefaces maybe uh, i was thinking yesterday that the definition for variable fonts uh, could be another level of definition would be the number of axes that could give you an idea of how complex how complex the typeface might be not the same to have a double axis font or a six or do or 12 or whatever axis. So this can give you an idea if this typeface, what can it do? What, what is it made for, you see? Uh, well, uh, that's <laughs> yeah, it. If, we if have you do, do a static competition of how many axes 
you have. <laughs> yeah, because the one I, I was amazed with the, with uh, uh, Jamie Chang with time with Twin Line and with uh, Michael Parson today, because come on, it's amazing what they are doing. I don't know how many access I was afraid to ask, you know, <laughs> because it was completely it it was like magic, you know. Of course, it wasn't magic, but I can I can see that they are using technology. Uh, and it's limit, you see, they are pushing the boundaries of technology. And I liked a lot, for instance, the one of Lawrence, Lawrence Benny, uh, who said that this, I, I, I don't remember the product they were, they were talking about, that they developed this uh, thing to make the weight, the, the weight of the typefaces uh, more lighter. Because usually typefaces, they are already uh, small, but with this uh, application, they can they can cut the weight in half so so we're adding it's, file size as one of the criteria okay yeah. so maybe another criteria could be weight uh, weight of the file i don't know if it may be useful for someone that works in the web sure. there should be a type kilobytes versus like the weight of wood type <laughs> No, or maybe the type, there should be a type, like, you know, like in Glyphs, a, a kind of a specification. Maybe it should be, there should be something like uh, the designer, the number of axes, the whatever. Uh, that it's kind of, because many of this information, we have it already. It, it, we have it in the typefaces. There is in, uh, we can have it in, of course, in Google. We can have it also in, uh, in Adobe. We have it in uh, my fonts. All this information that I'm talking about, we have seen it already somewhere. Why can we? Why shouldn't we put um, some of these things together in a new way of, of uh, understanding typeface visually instead of the tags? That I've always have trouble with this because my students. I mean, the concept, as I said, solemn for me is not the same thing for them solemn or or funny or wedding typeface what is a wedding typeface you know it could be whatever you want or or hairy typeface or bubbly typeface or you see what i mean whatever i think that photography has to find its own um, language and it has to be defined by the way we use this language to design it to use it we do not find in in uh, in design uh, bubbly typefaces, <laughs> you see what I mean? We don't find that, and it's because of a reason. It's not a proper definition of a typeface. Why um, did you keep um, serif or stands as a defining character trait? There is a contradiction there, because in Spanish, because, well, in Spanish, <laughs> yeah. have, yes, Spanish is very, we have this a Spanish from Spain, where they call this palo seco, that means nothing to me, to me. But serif, for instance, is a French word, no? Or sans serif. So why is that still like a binary that is? Because we have to maybe create, create a new word like uh, ga like garaldas or like didonas, you know. Um, the success of uh, Vox has to do with that, that he invented those words to define something that didn't exist before. We should make new words to define things that we are inventing today. It's We're not uh, making a mistake. It's necessary. Maybe we can make a typeface. Uh, um, I wrote a quote here in my notes that I liked a lot. I forgot to read it. <laughs> that, um, let me see. Uh, let me see if I find it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, um, Gerard Unger uh, used to talk uh, of, of art of um, digital typefaces or strange typefaces. He he named them synthetic faces, like you know, like cyborgs, like something like that. And Sumner Stone used the word informal typefaces, and this was in 1998. So, why don't we invent a new word to define new shapes? Oh, the, uh, John Berry. 
Good question, Senia. Mei Chang. Other world scripts, other world scripts have these different words. Ah, for instance, all the research that I made uh, arrived to the conclusion that um, a taxonomy around type must be standardized. I mean, it's not an obligation, but it would be useful because it has it has to do with teaching, and if we want to form better graphic designers more with a more it's like you know it's like doctors i don't know how to say you cannot call the heart the 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 pumping muscle i don't know how if i make myself clear the name of the veins or the bones have names because of something that, I that's think uh -huh. that's be really contrarian here this is a horrible room to help me moderate in um, <laughs> please go I, in my classrooms, I make sure not to touch terminology at all, because to me, as soon as you have the name for something, that's what you're going to see. As soon okay. as you're like, you know, as soon as you start having it, you're going to, we're going to start categorizing, putting to boxes. And the so concept. If I, if I can remove as much of it as possible, you're going to get, you're going to be looking at it like you're going to have true sight. Like, right, it's like, it's the, I mean, it's the art class thing where it's like, you turn things upside down, you look at things, you look at the negative shape, you do all of these exercises to try to remove all the knowledge you have in order to see clearly. I understand what you see, uh, Xenia, because uh, for me, it's also important that, that the students learn the concept more than the words or the definition. But when you are trying to go to a more professional level i mean as a type professional you have to use the correct words or as uh, Catherine dixon says uh, there are contradictory terms so that's the point of having at least a huge um, yes a, a glossario you know a, a place a dictionary where you can say this term can be also referred as that, 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 that. because uh -huh. I think we're oh, being that's perfect. Yeah. and told to to go to the after hours party. Yes, I think that's actually as you can see, this is an ongoing conversation, and I would love to see the inputs of other people as well. So actually, what I can do is to move out to the hangout space. Yes. And then we can continue conversation and have the others as well to to make comments. Uh, I'd like to announce also then the uh, the Paris event. So I think that we have a May next year. Uh, so from 10th to 13th of the of May, we're gonna have the finally the on-site uh, event, like the conference that had been postponed uh, for for a couple of years. And uh, but yeah, we can we can talk more about that as well on the hangout space. There you go. We can talk about a, little bit, a bit about call for papers. We can talk about early bird tickets if you are interested in that as well. So yeah, I'd like to thank you, Leonardo, so much for for your presentation, and uh, and I hope that this is actually a kickoff of uh, collaboration uh, uh, among people, and then maybe even on Paris next year we can show some de further developments of the, of this research, and then how we can actually put that in, into practice. So yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Senia. And uh, also for everybody that have been here uh, the last uh, three days, the different time zones, people like staying awake all night long or people who, who are like waking up so very, very early or staying up too late to, to watch out the, the, the presentations. Uh, and then just like a reminder also for the, if you missed a few of the presentations, which is kind of understandable because of the time zones, they'll be available until December. So then we have still like a month or so to, to catch up with all the presentations. And yeah, so that's it for us. Uh, thanks so much for everybody. See you in the Hangout space or in Paris or both. Preferably. Both. <laughs> both. Thank you. Why not both? <laughs> all right. Thank you so much.